Are you taking the SAT soon and wondering how you can totally crush the reading portion of the exam? If so, in this video, I'm gonna go through the steps that it takes to get a perfect score on the SAT reading portion. If you're wondering who I am, my name's Brooke. I've been teaching the SAT for over a decade and a half. I recently coached a student who is my private student to a perfect score overall on the SAT of 1600. We're gonna share with you some of my secrets. And if you want even more secrets, head to supertutortv.com and you can check out the best SAT prep course ever. That's where I'm gonna go super in depth. I have like hours and hours upon hours of like all the little nooks and crannies of how this test works. So if you wanna get inside that brain space, that's the ticket. You can also subscribe to our mailing list, supertutortv.com slash subscribe. And you can check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of good stuff. Follow me. Cool. Okay, so the first thing that I want to clarify is I'm going to talk specifically in this video just about the reading portion, the reading comprehension portion, not necessarily about the writing and language section. We'll maybe do another video on that at some point, but I'm just talking about that 400 points that's part of that 800 reading and writing and language score, but we're just going to hone in on the reading section. I think this is like the bane of some students' existence. I feel like this is the most challenging section for most students on the SAT. So we're going to try to dig deep and talk about all the ways that you can become super proficient on this exam. My first tip is to start early. Thumbs up if you're taking the test in less than a week. If so, it doesn't mean that you can't take to heart some of the tips that I'm gonna give here, but the truth is to build your reading skills takes time. Reading is not the fastest skill to improve in the world. It's one of the most collective skills that we have. It builds on itself over time. So if it's something that you can start early on, you're gonna be much better at it in the long run. It doesn't mean you have to start prepping for the SAT, but you can start building some of the skills that I'm gonna talk about and that's like a basically baseline that you can build from to then really get an awesome score. Number two, practice reading. I know a lot of people say to prep for the SAT, a good way to do it is to like read lots of articles and things like the New York Times. And I agree with that, especially if you're trying to build a foundation to get a super awesome score, and especially if you've got time to do it. Now, if your SAT is next week, don't go reading the New York Times. Try to study for the SAT, take a practice SAT. You gotta look at where you are on the calendar in terms of how you're going to address your desire to improve. But if you are younger, if you're in like early high school or middle school or something like that, cool. I'm talking to you guys. For you guys, one of the best things that you can do to really get ready for the SAT is to familiarize yourself with the kinds of texts that you're going to see on the exam. So let's talk about what kind of material I mean. Now, I know a lot of students at school are exposed to literature, which is on the SAT. So it's important that you have a good handle on literature and that you're comfortable reading literature. One of the best things that you can do as a student to improve your comprehension of literature is to actually start reading the books that you're assigned in English class instead of just reading the spark notes. If you're doing that kind of thing, you might be putting yourself at a disservice. Maybe try reading both at the same time or listening to the audiobook or like getting used to the kind of language that you're going to hear in those books. So actually read your books in English class if you're not already. But literature, like I said, sometimes that's a checkbox. We did that in school. Okay, I'm kind of comfortable with that. Second kind of text that you guys read in school, you guys are reading textbooks. Well, textbooks aren't on the SAT at all. And textbooks are like this weird amalgamation of a bunch of information in a particular format that's dished up for high school students. That's not what you're gonna read at all on the SAT. And that's what throws students off a lot of the time because you're exposed to a type of material that you're just not used to. So if you really wanna do well on this test, one of the best things you can do for yourself is to get used to that kind of material that you're going to see. And what is that kind of material? Here's what I'm gonna talk about. First, articles in modern magazines, journals, etc. What kind of articles? Well, for the social science component, usually there's one social science passage or so. The Economist, The New York Times, Time Magazine, The Atlantic. Those are good sources that are gonna have the level of writing that you're looking at. And then for science, there's usually two science passages. So actually my best advice is bulking up on science magazines. And those articles are going to come from magazines like Smithsonian, Science Daily, MIT Technology Review, New Scientist, Wired Magazine, Scientific American, Science Magazine, American Scientist, or Science News. The second kind of material that you're gonna find on your SAT is nonfiction books by scientists, thinkers, and social science researchers, okay? Now, these books are the kind of books that you could potentially find on the nonfiction New York Times bestseller list. Third kind of passage, maybe a little less fun for some of you, is what I call historical primary sources. That's like writing straight up from people like Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Paine, Thomas Jefferson, Alexis de Tocqueville, Charles Darwin, whoever it is, historical kind of people writing old fashioned sounding passages that I know make lots of students across America cringe, 
but they don't have to be that bad. And the more of them that you expose yourself to, the better off you're going to be. These kind of passages, you can also just practice them with like practice SAT exams, or you can head over to Khan Academy and they've got some practice passages as well. And that's also a good way to expose yourself to these, especially if you're closer to the exam. Next tip number three practice with a ton of real materials. One of the best things you can do to improve your SAT score, and I know I say this all over the place, all over my channel, is use real tests. There's nothing like a real SAT because they're statistically aligned to be a certain level of difficulty, and so you can get your score gauge and you know how you're doing. And you can't do that as well if you're pulling stuff from Kaplan or Princeton or whoever. The College Board has released 10 official tests. Occasionally, two students are able to come up with what are called QASs or question and answer service. Just be careful that you only are looking at officially released tests. The goal is you want to be scoring perfectly on at least a couple practice tests before you go in the day out. And if you're not, it's pretty unlikely that it's going to happen on test day. Does it? It probably does to somebody. Have I ever had a student score perfectly that never scored perfectly on a practice test? No. Have I had students score perfectly on practice tests and then not on the day of? Yes. Test anxiety. It happens to all of us. The next thing that you have to do if you want to score perfectly on the SAT is you've got to get your approach down. I liken this to if you're taking tennis lessons, it's like getting your swing right, you know? In the same way, Understand that you're going to have to find tactics to address this test that aren't necessarily the same tactics you use in the real world. Know that the SAT is not a test like the test your English teacher gives you every week at class. It's a totally different beast. It's open book. It's different. And so you want to hone your approach. Some skills that I like to teach to my students that it's good for them to master when it comes to mastering the approach. One, you've got to learn how to really read the passage well. How do you get the most out of that passage read so that you're not wasting time, so that you're mapping things out? And what I mean by that is you know what is where, you know, like what's in this paragraph, what's in this paragraph, like what's my, uh, you know, outline. If I had to give an outline of the passage bullet points, what would that be? So that I know where things are and it makes it really easy for me to go back and forth between the questions and the passage. Number two, the second thing that I like to do with approach is I always want to be trying to find perfect answers before I look down. I don't want to look at the answer choices too fast. If I do, I can start to confuse myself and convince myself of wrong answers. So I always want to have like that pure mind. I want to avoid the power of suggestions. So I always like read the question, try to figure out what it, the answer is before I look down, right? So this is part of my approach, you know, knowing like, okay, the first time I read the answer choices, I'm going to read fast. And the second time I'm going to read slow. Because if a question's easy, you don't want to waste a ton of time investigating the answer choice you think might be right when the answer choice is like a bell from heaven. And if you just got down to it, you would have known instantly it was right. In any case, my point is, is you've got to have an approach. You've got to have, this is how I'm going to walk through each question and know what it is and be able to tackle it, right? Just like a tennis player has their swing, right? You've got to get your approach down. And that takes practice. Okay, number five. You gotta learn the personality of the test. As I say in some of my other videos, the SAT has a personality. And that means it has particular quirks. It has like weird things about it that are particular to it and to no other test in the multiverse. A couple of weird preferences the SAT has. One weird preference of the SAT. Cause and effect has to be explicit. So if you have two things that both occur simultaneously, it doesn't mean one caused the other. You have to explicitly see in the passage that one causes the other. Even if you know from outside information one causes the other, that's not enough has to say it in the passage. So that's one kind of thing that you can't infer on the SAT that a lot of people might not be aware of, but it's a weird preference of the test. In any case, you need to learn the personality of the SAT. Why is one answer better than the other? That's like when you get down to two answer choices and then you think they both look almost identical, right? And you're like, oh, uh, now what, right? That's the point at which really understanding the preferences of the SAT and all its little idiosyncrasies is going to really help you out. That's so necessary to get that perfect score. You've got to know this test. And it's not empirical knowledge. It's not like anything that you would get by taking any other test or by doing anything else in your life or by being super smart or anything for the most part. It's stuff that you learn because this is the way the SAT works. Cool. Cool. Number six, pace yourself. So I know it seems kind of weird that like a top student would really need to pace themselves, but I honestly think this is one of the things that sometimes throws students off at the last minute. You can know all the content. You can be super perfect. You can know how to do everything, but if you don't keep moving, on the reading section, you can totally get like slimed and trapped and screw things up. It doesn't necessarily happen that often to somebody who's a really strong reader, but it can happen. So always use a watch. Don't be above the watch. Don't expect there to be a clock in the room. Do not rely on the proctor to be super reliable with time. You should keep your own timekeeping device. Inevitably, the reading section is hard. And even I, almost every test, have one or two questions where I have a moment where I go, <gasps> Oh my gosh, I have no idea all the answer choices look like. Oh my goodness, this is so hard, right? I get that feeling too. So when you get that feeling, you have to know what you're going to do. 
I cannot let myself get stuck in the muck of the mire of a single question or two questions while I'm midstream. I have to keep moving. That doesn't mean I'm not going to come back and fight for the answer. I am, but I'm going to leave that for the end of the test. The SAT is paced well enough that usually you can finish the thing with enough time at the end to then go back to the hard ones. And I find that that's like a best strategy for people who are really aiming for that near perfect score because you're going to have a couple of like, oh crap questions are really hard questions and that's fine. And if you're going to wrestle with them, wrestle with them, but wrestle with them at the end because otherwise you might over wrestle and then you're going to mismanage your time. And sometimes it's just like really problematic. Okay, number seven, my last tip is more of a long game tip, which is build your vocabulary. Though the SAT does not test vocabulary super heavily, not nearly as heavily as the old test used to pre-2016. If you're aiming to get a perfect score on the reading portion, I occasionally see that vocabulary is like the last straw that, that dings a couple of points off on some of my best students. What's tough is there's only one or two really intense vocabulary words probably per SAT. They're not common. So not necessarily the most important thing to up your score for everyone, but it is important if you're trying to be flawless. So how do you increase your vocabulary? Well, again, this is a long game kind of thing. If you can start early, that's awesome. There's a few books that I like. I like Six Weeks to Words of Power. I like 30 Days to More Powerful Vocabulary. I like Verbal Advantage. In any case, you've got to have an awesome vocabulary if you really want those last few questions on the SAT. And I think that's about it. So. I hope you guys liked this video. Hopefully it was a little bit helpful in terms of knowing kind of all the pieces that need to come together for you to completely crush the reading section of the exam. Subscribe to our channel and go watch some more videos. There's more tips where this came from. And I'll see you guys next time. Thanks for watching.